Well, in the category of proof that the end of the world is near, I bring you this news story from New Haven, Connecticut, home of the prestigious Yale University. There's a nine-year-old named Jericho Scott. That's a cool name, by the way. Uh, he plays Little League, or I should say played Little League baseball there. He was pitching for a team that started the year 8-0, undefeated at under nine Little League baseball, uh, largely owing to Jericho Scott, who could throw a 40-mile-an-hour fastball. Uh, I mean, that's not insane, but it's pretty neat for a nine-year-old. Um, it was leading their team to an undefeated season when other teams who are likely having undefeated seasons themselves begin to get nervous about their showdown with Jericho Scott. Parents began complaining to the league. They said that it was a safety issue and that if he were to hit a player, it would all be over. Keep in mind, he has never actually hit a player yet at this point, although I'm sure after this incident, he would be inclined to. Uh, but he did strike a lot of people out. Anyway, the league caved into parent pressure and said that he could, he could still play, mind you. He could just no longer pitch. Um, the coach at the next game sent him out to the mound anyway. The opposing team pulled their uh, players off the field in protest. The league responded by disbanding Jericho's team and sending all of the players to opposing teams. Raises this question in my mind as a proud father of an under nine soccer player. Uh, why do kids play sports? Why do kids play sports anyway? Is it to win? I mean, I know it. at the U9 soccer that my daughter plays, they don't even keep score. And the girls try to keep score. Fortunately, they lose track after about 15. Um, <laughs> these are games are not known for their defensive powers <laughs> here. Uh, I don't think it's to win. Maybe uh, by the time you're in high school, you're playing to win, but it's little kids, not really. Um, why do parents make their kids play sports? I hope it's not to teach them to win. Um, those are the crazy parents and you don't want to be like those parents. The theory is that you have your kids play sports so they learn how to do a team dynamic. They learn the joys of, of winning and losing. They learn new skills. They learn challenges. They learn how to handle victory with grace and defeat likewise with grace. In fact, you could say that sports are some of the best tools for taking little boys and making them into men. The story of Jericho Scott strikes me as odd because it's very clear when you look at the facts of it, the parents weren't so much concerned about their own kid's safety, they were concerned about their own kid's ego, getting smoked by a 40 mile an hour fastball from another nine year old and having their little precious snowflakes feelings hurt. Of all the things that kids do in sports, facing down a fastball is probably the scariest. I think it could be the high dive at a pool or something, but I think the fastball might win because it's something that's out of your control. It forces you, win or lose, to face your fears, to face the game and mature. And this story is not unique about Jericho. This is a cultural epidemic. The journal Psychology Today has an article that I read this week called A Nation of Wimps, <laughs> which laments the American phenomena of how parenting has morphed into it. The goal of American parents now, the article says, is, quote, to make sure their little darlings don't experience even the slightest scrape, scratch, or care. Gone are the days, this article points out, of parents on the perimeter of the parks. Gone are the days of parents watching their kids play in the waves at the beach, trying to figure out the waves and the, the undertow for themselves. Those days are long gone. Gone are the days of kids in tricycle derby races down the cul-de-sac. Now they're have helmets on and are cruising at three miles an hour, likely with the tricycle attached to a pole connected to a parent <laughs> right behind them. No more skin knees on playgrounds. Oh no, they have some kind of substance that the kids just bounce right off of onto their feet. Not that they would trip anyway because the, the toys that would make you trip are also long gone. The article says, quote, today's parents are now spending a great deal of their time doing little more than protecting their children from life. The author, Dr. Estraf Morano, says that this has created a, quote, wholly sanitized childhood without skinned knees or the occasional sea in history. Al Mohler, who's president of Boyce College and Southern Seminary, says, quote, today's kids have to excel at everything, even if it's the parents who actually do the work. And no, that doesn't change when the kids go off to college. Understand the mindset behind this. Parents want their kids to be the best in the class. If it's an art project, even for a first grader, and it seems subpar, most parents now will just do the project for their kid so their kid can bring home a perfect project to school rather than risking their kids not doing something exactly right. 
John Portman, he teaches religious studies at the University of Virginia, says this. He says this is behind the increase in drugs that are prescribed to kids. Quote, parents expect their children to be perfect. They're supposed to be the smartest, the fastest, the most charming people in the world. And if they can't get their children to prove that on their own, they'll turn to doctors to make their kids into the people their parents believe their kids truly are. He goes on to say parents' goals now is to eliminate messing up from life. John Portman says kids aren't allowed to babble and play talk, swim the wrong way, or use anything less than the perfect form in kicking a soccer ball. Even kids in the backyard will be interrupted in playing soccer to have their form corrected. A temptation I myself may have given into on <laughs> one or two occasions. <laughs> Stephen Hyman, who's a provost at Harvard, says this, quote, it's interfering now with the core mission of the university because this is how the students come to our school, Harvard. The students come to Harvard with that as their upbringing. He says that the, this is often exasperated by what he describes as constant and incessant communication with their parents even while at college. He points out that kids of the 80s and 90s were often labeled or stereotyped as neglected parents. Kids of the 80s and 90s came from divorced homes generally. They would come home from school, play in the park until their parents got home from work, have dinner in front of a TV and had very little parental interaction. That had its own issues, of course, that the colleges experienced uh, a couple decades ago. Now, colleges don't experience that. The students that are at these colleges now come from families where they're communicating with their parents every single day, even at college, texting mom or dad after any conversation with a friend, texting mom or dad after any criticism in, about an assignment or any conflict or a menu item at the cafeteria that they don't like. <laughs> the Psychology Today article by Murano Dr. Marana writes, quote, these kids, quote, typically report every flicker of experience, which keeps them in a permanent state of dependency on their parents. You understand what that sentence means? They communicate to their parents any flicker of experience, anything that approaches an experience, they tell their mom or dad about immediately, which keeps them from having to process anything on their own. The sad thing is, this is not Dr. Marano says me, the sad thing is that Christian parents seem to have bought into this as if protecting kids from life was the goal of parenting. <laughs> protecting kids from, from bad things happening to them is the goal of parenting. And it shouldn't be that. Let me ask the question this way. What's a more successful kid? One with straight A's or one who's ready to spend his life in the self-sacrifice for Christ? They're often not the same thing. And it used to be that both of them were rare. Well, now straight A's are not rare because if there's an A minus, the professor is stormed by a mob of angry parents. <laughs> the truth is, and this affects both boys and girls, but there's a specific way that this kind of culture affects boys. It seems obvious that our generation is really pushing the envelope on what it means to be a man. In Bible times, a person was considered a man around age 13 or 14. Can you believe that? <laughs> 14-year-olds could be married, would be expected to go fight, could be a parent, would have a job. This was true not just in the Bible times, but all the way into the 1600s, 1700s even. The Industrial Revolution took boys and put them into factories. And that was followed by kind of a reformation in the way we view childhood, the, the, the birth of public school system, and eventually the classroom became an extension, a way to escape from the factory, an extension of childhood. As the classroom grew and grew and grew and school became more and more mandatory and now it's you know, mandatory to go to community college and, and college and it's gonna be mandatory to go to graduate school, school soon enough, soon there's no such concept as graduating in life. Everything gets extended and extended and extended. The classroom produces this concept of adolescence, a time between being a boy and a man that is grounded less in science and more in just the way kids these days act. I call this a phrase that I've stolen from Joshua and, and Brett Harris, the myth of adolescence. And the idea that our culture has created this, this dynamic of, of kids now between 14 and then when does adolescence end? You know, you've got young adult ministries and whatnot, things that go all the way up into to cover. You know, you're a 30-year-old, you're still, you're still not quite an adult. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. You could have been drafted for 12 years, but you're not quite an adult. These last 30 so years have seen that push further and further back. 
And you, of course, are aware of this phenomena. We have a world where college students who live, act, and think, and behave like boys, not men. The whole, whole, I'm not old enough to get a job yet. I'm not old enough to live on my own. I'm not old enough to get married. I'm only 25. What are you out of your mind? <laughs> the result is 20-somethings who spend their time playing video games and surfing the net, waiting for their adult years to ring the doorbell and show up. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And this raises the question, what does it mean to be a man. What does it mean to go from being a boy to a man? Manhood's a function. It's not an age. You don't become a man when you vote at 18, when you drink at 21, or when you rent a car at 25. Men lead. They make decisions. And more importantly, they take responsibility for those decisions, both right and wrong. They succeed and they fail. And they learn lessons from both. Men take responsible chances. They plan. They work. They get things done. They stand in against 40-mile-an-hour fastballs. <laughs> And there's some sort of rite of passage that usually accompanies this change. Moving out is what it used to be, but not anymore with extended communication in the way some moving out situations are. You know, moving out with other teenage friends that, you know, don't have a legitimate job doesn't quite count as growing up. For some, it's going off to school. But even with the constant communication and the ability to go home to mom and dad when anything goes wrong, that even limits the ability to grow up. For some, it's getting a real job. For some, it just comes down to being willing to lead, to man up, and take responsibility for your life. Solomon here in 1 Kings chapter 2 is going to be thrust from being a prince who is pampered in the royal household. He's a prince that is, is guarded, protected. He has whatever he wants. We've seen how David's sons live from, from 2 Samuel. They get whatever they want. Solomon's going to go from being the pampered child to being the man on the throne. David is dying and he's just put all of his political eggs in one basket, namely Solomon. He's about to be thrust from boyhood to manhood. Let's join this in chapter two, verse one. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying this, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know, David may be very, very important, but he's gonna die like everybody else who's ever lived. Be strong, he says, and show yourself a man. And the first mark, I'm going to give you three marks of being a man, three imperatives of biblical manhood. The first is be strong. Be strong, he says. It's interesting that he ties this phrase to being a man. He says, be strong because you're going to be a man. You want to show yourself a man, then you have to have the strength to do it. And I don't think he's even talking about physical strength here, although that can certainly be part of it. It's courage. It's the discipline to do what's required. You see this word used over and over again in the Old Testament when there's a challenge to someone to, in a sense, man up. God himself tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. It's the same attitude there. It's this term of courage, this physical strength that's wrapped up into it. It's the, this idea of strength that you will set out to do what you are called to do. You won't say, I can't do it. It's out of my league. That's not what, what being a man is to stand against the fastballs of life, to make hard choices, to do hard things, to try and to fail. When building physical strength, you sometimes keep lifting and keep lifting until it, you can't do it anymore, knowing that the next time you will be stronger. That's what makes you stronger for the next time. It's interesting that Solomon's charge is kind of tied to that. Be strong, David tells Solomon. Keep going after it. Keep going after it. My neighbor had a broken pipe in his basement it wasn't draining from his his dryer he uh, from sorry from his washer the pipe wasn't draining so he called a plumber out the plumber looked at it and said this is this is just not it's gonna be too hard to fix <laughs> plumber says too hard <laughs> don't do it just live with a washer that doesn't drain right because you don't want to know what happens next and so my neighbor decides he's going to get a jackhammer. And he does. The guy who did our stage in the worship center lent him a jackhammer because he's a friend. And I said, no, no, a friend would not do that to you. <laughs> lent him a jackhammer. He tore up his basement floor, pulled off the carpet, jackhammered through the concrete, cut through the plastic wrap that was under his foundation, dug out the gravel, and is now taking out the pipe that runs across the floor of his basement because a plumber wouldn't do it. And I said, How why would you do this? I couldn't even conceive of starting like this. And he said, you know what? That's what you do when you own a house. You get after it. Okay. <laughs> I'll remember that. I'll get after it. <laughs> this is David's attitude towards Solomon. You want to be a man? You do what it takes. 
You be strong. You get after it. If there's a problem, you fix it. You don't run and hide. If you're a leader, you lead. You feel the ball that's hit at you. You don't cower behind the shortstop. That's Solomon's charge for manhood. David's last words here to his, Sol- to his son begins with be strong so that you can be like a man. This is not confined to some Old Testament ethic. You see this in the New Testament as well. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, be watchful. And then Paul says this, stand firm, act like men, be strong. And the way those are imperatives are tied in the Greek, it's clear that he's addressing the same group of people. Be strong, act like a man, be strong, he says. Be strong. There's a spiritual element, of course, to this as well. 1 John 2, 14, I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one, John says. John says, I'm particularly calling out the young men who are Christians. I'm addressing you because you have something going for you, he says. He, and he, John, if you're familiar with that section of 1 John chapter 2, he addresses the, the older men. He addresses the children in the faith. But he addresses strong young men. He, the older men, he says, you're wise. You know how to do battle with the evil one. The children, he says, you're saved. You're forgiven by God. He's not talking about uh, little kids by, by age, chronological age. He's talking about maturity in Christ. And he addresses specifically young men in Christ. You're strong, he says, because the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. The first imperative of manhood is, is strength. And, you know, we live in such an effeminate age that, that takes that away. You know, strength in our age is, is men who know who to complain to, <laughs> how to get a good hashtag, how to whine to get things done by other people, how to be victims, not leaders. That's not what David's charge is to Solomon. His charge to Solomon is that you be strong. The implication, we're gonna see, uh, you may think I'm reading between the lines here, we're gonna see what that strength looks like through the rest of the chapter. But the idea is you be strong to do what you need to do. No more excuses, no more, no more sitting back. You can fail. David doesn't say, hey, bat 100. You can, or bat 1,000, I guess, would be the batting analogy. But he doesn't tell him you have to be perfect. He doesn't say, you know, don't ever miss a pitch. He says, go out there and try. Be strong, go after it. Go after it. Number two, be strong. Secondly, be obedient. Be strong so you're like a man. Be obedient. Verse three, keep the charge of Yahweh your God, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments with his rules and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Now the verse numbers are here, of course, are not inspired. So the show yourself a man and the and here, it's, it's connective. They're uh, to it. So this idea, you're strong, so you show yourself your man, and you're obedient to the words of God. It's tied to manhood. Men will obey what God's word says. They recognize there's authority above himself. There are some men, you know, the stereotypical, you know, burly man has no authority. He, his own strength is his own authority. He can do whatever he wants to do because that's how strong he is. That's not a biblical man. A biblical man recognizes that he's going to do what he can do, but there's some authority above him also. The authority above him is the word of God. So he's gonna be a strong leader, but he recognizes all of his strength is used in subservience to someone else, namely the word of God. Keep the charge of Yahweh, David says. Whatever Yahweh tells you, you do. And it's not subjective either, because then David drills down on it, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. These are all synonyms for God's word from Psalm 119. Everything the law, the law says, the Torah says, it's a statute, a rule, a commandment. Do what God commands you to do in scripture. That doesn't come easy. You have to, first of all, know what the book says in order to do what the book says. You can't obey the command if you don't know what the command is. And so it becomes you're using your strength, your spiritual strength to get into the word of God and find the imperatives and apply them to your life. That's what David says men do. They apply the word of God to their life so they can keep it. I used to be a soccer referee and it was my, it was my job. And then part of this, this job was that I had to be able to pass a test and the test, there was a physical strength test, but there was also a written test test. And for the written test, you could be asked any question about the rule book and you would have to answer verbatim. And I'm very thankful that one of my mentors uh, back before I started just told me, you have to memorize the rule book. Just memorize the rule book. That's the easiest way. Memorize the rule book so you can reproduce it. You could, I could, when I was doing this, I could have been handed a, a notebook and I could have written you out the soccer rule book, uh, which was, you know, 18 pages long. It's not, in, you know, there's 18 rules in soccer. One of the reasons that it's 
so much better than other sports. <laughs> You could write it out, though. You could reproduce it. And, and so often in a game, a you know, coach would yell at you about the rule, and you just quote it right back to him, and he looks stunned. And you're like, here's this guy who's complaining to you. He has no idea what he's even talking about. He'd never, you could tell he'd never heard that before from the rule book. It's a shame when Christians have that same attitude. They're confronted with something in the Word of God, and they act as if they'd never heard that before. They'd never seen it before. I think the stuff you put your effort into memorizing and into studying, and you're not studying the Word of God just for its own sake. You're studying it so that you can keep it. You're studying it so you can keep it. Some of you parents have your kids in a Awana from doing time and memorying. I didn't mean to sound, make it sound like a, a jail sentence, doing time in Awana, doing memory <laughs> verses, but from doing time in Awana with the memory verses, you can tell there's a couple of different ways the kids memorize the verse. Some of them actually know the verse. <laughs> Some of them will sit at their table and, and read it real quick and then run over to you and split it out real quick and then go back to their table and try to do the next one real quick and, and back to you. And the goal for them is to get through as many of their, their cards as you can. It's not really the goal of Scripture, though. You're memorizing it so that it takes root in the heart so that you can keep it and do what it says. Do what it says. What's the implication behind it? How do you keep his statutes? Not all of his statutes are imperatives. Not everything in scripture is a command for you to do, and yet you're supposed to keep all of it. So how do you keep things that aren't even imperatives? You apply them to your heart. You let them form the way you think about God. You wrestle with the implications of what scripture says to every area of life. That's what men do. It's more than just reading your, your Bible more. It's a, a creating a pattern of keeping it in your life. Another way to say it differently, a person who's immature lacks biblical wisdom. A man is not just a man because of his age and his strength. He's a man because he has biblical wisdom. He's spiritually mature. Spiritually mature, you could say it this way, spiritual maturity is the true mark of Christian manhood. A spiritually immature man in this critical area is just a boy. Notice that there's a so that in this. Keep the charge of Yahweh walking in his ways and testimonies as it's written in the law of Moses. And there's a so that. So that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. God is going to establish Solomon's kingdom. God made a covenant with David. He made a covenant with David that he would always have a descendant on the throne and that his descendants would seek after him and eventually it would lead to the Messiah. This is the lesson for Solomon. And you could say the promise to David was that one of his descendants would always be eligible to be king, would always be eligible to be the Messiah. But that word eligible is a little bit misleading, you know? Last year, technically speaking, I was eligible for the NFL draft. <laughs> being eligible is not quite what you're after. <laughs> not quite the same thing as being drafted. Not quite the same thing as being ready. This is what David's charge is to Solomon. Don't be eligible for God's kingdom. Take the word of God, apply it to your life so that you can be serving in it. So you can be serving in it. So you have to be strong. Secondly, you have to be obedient. Thirdly, you have to walk in his ways. You have to walk in his ways. You are faithful, I think is what your notes say. You have to be faithful. You have to be strong. You have to be obedient. Thirdly, you have to be faithful. And the term faithful here is different than just being obedient. Obedient is the immediate application of the word of God. Faithfulness speaks of your long-term pattern, how you go in the long term, the, the footprints that you leave, the path that you lay out where you walk over and over and over again. That's this term that you walk to the same spot and you're always seen walking in the word of God. That's this idea that you will always be found walking in the word of God. And this is what you see down to verse four, that Yahweh may establish his word that he spoke concerning me. If your son pays close attention to their way, they'll walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart, with all their soul. You'll never lack a man on the throne of Israel. That's the eligible part right there. But notice that phrase in the middle of it. They'll walk before me in faithfulness. The mark of a man's life is that he is continually faithful in the world. word. It's not a one-time thing for him. It's not that he's in church on Sunday. That's not so much the point. The point is that he has a habit of repeatedly walking in God's word. The ways of the word of God are not strange to him. The ways of scripture are not foreign to him. He's familiar with them. He knows where things are laid out. He knows where to find answers. He knows how to take the truths of scripture, apply them in life so that he obeys him, but obeys them over the long term. So a biblical man is someone who's strong and wants to be a leader and do what God says. He's obedient. He's following the commands of Scripture. And he's faithful over the long term in his life. He is marked by maturity. If your life is marked by immaturity right now, 
I encourage you to repent and decide, you know what, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to grow up. I'm not going to keep dragging this out. I don't always want to be a boy. I mean, there's a tragic thing that happened in churches, I think, in 20 years ago or so. I read a book recently called The Juvenilization of American Christianity that, that brought this point home. You know, you go back 40 or 50 years, it was not considered good to be immature. You didn't go to church to be surrounded by immature people. You went to church to be surrounded by mature people. You wanted immaturity modeled. You wanted people who are immature brought up. But something changed. I think through a lot of the surveys that talked about how the church is always dying. The church is always dying. By the way, those surveys should be dying. <laughs> the church is always dying. If we don't reach young people, the church will die. And the Jesus died for nothing if we don't get young people in the church. That kind of attitude. And so churches start marketing for the lowest common denominator. And at the same time in our worldly culture, youth becomes cool with disposable income, extended adolescence gets to buy things. And so it becomes a mark of the church to be like the kids these days, to be immature, to dress in an immature way, to act in an immature way, to speak in an immature way, to have immature music. It's a full package deal to appeal to the immature with the idea that if the young kids, because you want the young kids who are by definition immature, to be attracted to the word of God so the church will live. Do you think that's going to work long term? That's a, if you build a church in immaturity, you have an immature church. That's the church that's going to die. You can build a church on maturity, on depth, not after attracting youth, but attracting people who love the truth would be the idea here. Scripture says if you want to be a man, you decide you're going to act strongly. You're going to be obedient to what the word says and you're going to be faithful. So if you're here tonight and you, you look at your own life and you say, you know what, I am spiritually speaking a boy, spiritually speaking immature, I, I need to grow up. Great. Repent of your immaturity and say, I'm going to put myself into the word of God. I'm going to make strong decisions in my life. I am going to act. I'm going to get wisdom from other people. I'm not going to act independently. I'm going to get wisdom from other people, but I'm going to act and do the things I need to do the way God tells me to do them. That doesn't make you a man right there. You have to then demonstrate that for a period of time in faithfulness. That's what marks you as a man, the faithfulness over your life. If you walk before the Lord in faithfulness, he'll be honored by the way you live your life. Well, that's the spiritual charge to David. But like all of scripture, David doesn't separate the spiritual charge from the practical applications of it. And so the rest of chapter two becomes the last words of David with the practical application. Spiritually, I want you to be strong and obedient and faithful and be a man, Solomon. Now practically, here's a few things you can do for me. And so this chapter gets kind of fun, I think, from, from here on out. So we're gonna shift gears and see how Solomon applies being told to be a man first, verse five. Moreover, you also know what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner and the son of Ner and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace for the blood that has been shed in war, putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of his feet. Act, therefore, according to your wisdom, but don't let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. <laughs> you gotta like, Solomon, I want you to grow up and be a man, strong and courageous and be a leader. Also, remember Joab and do whatever you think is right for him, but I would really like him to die a horrible death. So do whatever you think is right. You guys remember Joab, right? He was kind of in many ways the hero of Second Kings. He's the one that kept the kingdom together. He was not necessarily a godly man. He was not even a, you know, he wasn't in it for himself either. He's one of those rare people in world history that he wasn't, most people learned it for themselves or for God. Not, not Joab, he fit kind of a middle category. He was in it for the nation. He was the picture of the guy who was patriotic more than anything else. He didn't care what David said. If it wasn't right for Israel, he wasn't going to listen to David. The flip side of that is he didn't care what God said because if it wasn't right for Israel, he didn't care. He became the final arbiter of what he thought was right for his country and he would do it. So the reference about Abner, remember, this is from 2 Samuel chapter 3 where Abner was fighting a battle. Abner was uh, Saul's general. And after Saul had died, David thought he could make peace with Abner. And it would be a, you know, a, a nice transition in the empire. All the people who are loyal to Saul would come under David. There would be no bloodshed and it would be a happy day. Joab did not think that was in Israel's best interest. <laughs> Plus Abner had the, you know, the misfortune of killing Joab's brother in war. It wasn't Abner's fault. It was a war and his brother started it, but his brother died. And so Joab was mad at Abner. So Joab didn't just kill Abner, if you remember. He waited until Abner went into David and they had, you know, a nice peace talk and they had a handshake and everything and it was all solved. It was going to be a peaceful transition. Everything was forgiven. 
This is 2 Samuel 3, verse 21. Then Abner returned to Hebron. Joab took him aside in the midst of the gate to speak with him privately. And he went with Joab, thinking Joab's from David. We have peace. What's to worry about? This is 2 Samuel 3, verse uh, 27. He took him aside privately, where he struck him in his stomach so that he died. <laughs> Verse 28, afterward, when David heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before Yahweh for the blood of Abner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is a leper or who holds a spindle or who falls by the sword or who is starving for they lack bread. That's a nice curse from David in 2 Samuel 3. May your whole family be leprous. <laughs> but David didn't do anything himself. He said, one of these days, Abner, to avenge Abner, Joab, you're going to get it. One of these days, now David's on his deathbed, and he says, Solomon, bring about that day and bring it about quickly. <laughs> so that's the charge considering, um, concerning uh, Abner. Amasa was the other one David points out. He also killed Amasa. Uh, Amasa, if you remember, was <laughs> when David did finally fire Joab, when Joab killed Absalom. Remember this? David told the army, don't kill my son Absalom. Joab said, no way is Absalom living. He's totally going down. Uh, Joab killed Absalom. David fired Joab and gave the army over to Amasa. And uh, Joab was not cool with that. He, he didn't want his army to be fired or to taken away from him. So he kind of, he, he pulled the same trick he did with Abner. He hung around Amasa until Amasa demonstrated poor leadership. People weren't responding to him. And so Joab came up to help him. He offered to, to help Amasa with his leadership. This is 2 Samuel 20, verse 8. Joab put on a soldier's garment. And over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath fashioned on his thigh. And he went forward. Uh, as he went forward, it fell out of the holster. So he's walking forward and his sword falls out of his holster under his, his robe. Joab said to Amasa, is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand as if to kiss him. A nice soldierly kiss, I guess. But Amasa didn't see that there was a sword in Joab's hand. So Joab struck him in the stomach and spilled out his guts on the ground. He didn't even need to strike him a second time and Amasa died. And Amasa lay wallowing in his own blood in the highway as the whole army passed by and they stopped seeing him. That's how Joab killed Amasa. And again, David couldn't do anything about it. But now on his deathbed, he's going to deal with it. So verse six, act according to your wisdom, but make sure he dies a horrible death. <laughs> verse seven, deal loyally with the sons of Brazilii, the Gileadite. Remember, he showed kindness to David and helped him after David was thrown out of his empire. Brazilii led him back in and showed him kindness. He was a very wealthy man who, who used his resources to expand God's kingdom through David. Let him be among those who eat at your table. Such loyalty, they met me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Verse 8, there's also with you Shimei, the son of Gura, the Benjamite from Baharim, who cursed me with a grievous curse on the day I went to uh, Mahanim. Now, Shimei was the one who yelled at David, cussed at him, called him a dog. David's soldiers wanted to kill him. David said, hey, don't kill him. Maybe he's cussing at me because God sent him to cuss at me. It could be. It could be that I deserve this curse, so don't kill him because I need to be killing the messenger who's bearing the bad news, Right? Then in chapter 19 of, of 2 Samuel, Shimei comes and begs at David's feet, begging for forgiveness for, you know, cussing him out. I mean, he helped overthrow the king. The king comes back and he says, oh, I'm so, so, so sorry. It was not genuine repentance, remember. He was like so proud and arrogant. He put on his best clothes. He had an army of people. He said, oh, you don't even need to worry about it, king. I just want your forgiveness, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's not how you repent, right? I hope not. When you're repenting to God, you don't say, God, look at how well I'm dressed. Look at how cool I am. Just don't worry about it, God. That sin I did against you, don't worry about it. I got it handled. You just ignore it, I'll ignore it, and we'll all be happy with our lives. That was the way Shimei repented. And uh, David let him go. He said, okay, go. But he filed it away. He had his little, little revenge list. Filed it away. Wrote it down. Saw on a sheet of paper. He's going to remember it. I used to coach in soccer, this kid who... Uh, who kept his own revenge list on the piece of paper. He wrote it down. Any player who humiliated him on the field, any team that he, he lost to at the last minute, he wrote a little list down of people that he wanted revenge on. And this kid got, kept getting better and better through high school and, and slowly he would defeat a player. It was all soccer related. You know, he didn't like break into the house or anything. And, uh, when, he, when he would beat the team, he would cross the name off the list and he went off and he played at uh, Towson University and the play, one last name was on his revenge list. He went to play for... Uh, um, 
Notre Dame actually, and he was never able to cross that name off. And then Towson met Notre Dame in the soccer playoffs one year and Towson won. And he texted me a picture of his revenge list that he had from his ninth grade year in high school with the last name crossed off. <laughs> It's what David is doing here. He let Shimei go, but he wrote the name down on the little list, folded it up, put it in his pocket. Now on his deathbed, he's taking it off and he's reading it to Solomon. So be nice to these people, but definitely get those people. Remember Shimei, he cursed me and I told you, I will not put you to death with the sword. Verse nine, therefore don't hold him guiltless. You're a wise man. <laughs> you know what you ought to do to him, but you should bring his gray head down to the blood of Sheol. <laughs> do whatever you want, but there better be a lot of blood on that head. Verse 10, then David slept with his fathers. He was buried in the city of David. And at that time, David reigned over Israel 40 years. He reigned seven years over Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. Remember the first seven years of his reign, he hadn't conquered Jerusalem yet. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father. His kingdom was firmly established. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggaiath, came to Beth, uh, Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. You remember Adonijah, he was uh, formerly the king. I remember hearing Al Gore give a speech a while ago and, uh, Al Gore introduced himself, this is right after the election with uh, President Bush, he introduced himself as, as he said, hi, I'm Go Al Gore. Until recently, I was the next president of the United States. <laughs> it's a funny line. Um, that's uh, Adonijah's line right here. Hi, I'm Adonijah. Until recently, I was the next king of Israel. Uh, and then Solomon got elevated. Remember, Adonijah was one that was sworn in. People were celebrating and everything. And then David pulled the rug out from under him. He came to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and said, she said, do you come peacefully? And he said, peacefully. And he said, I have something to say to you. She said, speak. He said, you know that the kingdom was mine <laughs> until recently I was the next king of Israel. And all Israel fully expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's for it was his from Yahweh. And now I have one request to make if you don't refuse me. She said to him, speak. He said, please ask King Solomon. He won't refuse you to give me Abishag the Shumanite as my wife. That's the woman when David was so old, Abishag was given to him to keep him warm. They weren't intimate, but she was given to him to keep him warm. And Bathsheba said, very well, I'll ask the king tomorrow. <laughs> so Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. The king rose to meet her and he bowed down before her. He then sat on his throne and he had a seat brought for his king's mother and she sat on his right and she said, I have one small request. I'm in the image here is Solomon on the throne of David. He brings in a special seat for his mom right next to him, on his right, right next to him. So they're both sitting facing the court. And then she says, hey, one request while we're sitting here on our thrones, one small request. Don't refuse me. King said to her, make your request, my mother, and I won't refuse you. And she said, let Abishag, the Shumanite, be given to Adonijah, your brother, as his wife. Ah, heavy sigh. King Solomon answered his mother, why do you ask Abishag the Shumanite for Adonijah? Ask from the kingdom also. He's my older brother. And on his side are Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zariah. Remember when he became king, he had not, not the high priest, but a priest with him. He had Joab the general with him. So King Solomon swore by Yahweh saying, God do so to me and more also if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Therefore, as Yahweh lives, who's established me and placed me on the throne of David, my father, who made me a house as he promised, Adonijah will be put to death today. So King Solomon sent Benaniah, the son of Jehoiadiah, and he struck him down and he died. Now, Benaniah is an important person. He was the son of the high priest. Uh, he's allowed to go in the temple. He's going to become the leader of the army by 1 Kings chapter 4. He's going to end up taking Joab's place. But here's the first blood he spills and is striking, striking down Adonijah. And to Abiathar the priest, who was siding on, with Adonijah, he said, go to Anatoth for your state, for you deserve death, but I will not at this time put you to death because you carried the ark of the Lord Yahweh before David, my father, and because you shared in all my father's afflictions. So Solomon expelled Abiathar from being priest to Yahweh, thus fulfilling the word of Yahweh that he's spoken concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. And that's a strange little verse, but that's back from 1 Samuel chapter three, because Eli, his kids were being disobedient. They were uh, defiling the temple and the, ta the tabernacle. They were being immoral. God rebuked them and said, I'm not gonna let any of your kids ever be priest again. It's 1 Samuel 3, 12. Yahweh says on that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I've spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he didn't restrain him. Therefore, I swear that the house of Eli, the iniquity of Eli's house will never be atoned by sacrifice or offering forever. His descendants will not have their sin removed forever, God says. Now I bring that up because that's 1 Samuel chapter three. This is a long time ago 
When the book of Samuel ended, you think, what happened to that prophecy? Well, here you find it in 1 Kings chapter 2. I love when you see a prophecy in Scripture fulfilled later, even by the people acting who probably didn't even know it. I don't even know if Solomon knew about this. But he expels him, and God's word is is kept. Verse 28, when news came to Joab, and so Joab sees the king killed, he sees the, the priest that was killed, he's the last piece missing. Joab had supported Adonijah, he, even though, uh, although he had not supported Absalom. Joab fled to the tent of Yahweh and caught hold of the horns of the altar. Joab runs right to the tabernacle and clings on uh, to the Ark of the Covenant. What a strange move right here. He's not a religious man, remember. He's not really, he doesn't fear God. Are you kidding me, Joab? But when faced with death, <laughs> right to the tabernacle. You're going to kill me. You're going to need to kill me on uh, the Ark of the Covenant, on the, the horns of the altar is what it says. I mean, this is an intense move right here. Uh, nobody, nobody can go in there except a priest, by the way. But Joab's in there. David, I mean, Solomon happens to know a priest who's willing to kill Joab, and so he pages him. Buzzer goes off. All right. <laughs> I'm uniquely qualified for this job. Verse 30, Ben and I came to the tent of Yahweh and said to him, the king commands, come on out. And he says, no, I'll die here. So Ben and I brought the king word again, went back to the king. Joab said he wants to die there. And the king replied to him, verse 31, do as he said. <laughs> Give him his last request. <laughs> Strike him down and bury him and thus take away from me and my father's house the guilt of the blood that Joab shed without cause. Yahweh, Yahweh will bring back his bloody deeds on his own head because without the knowledge of my father David, he attacked and killed with the sword two men more righteous and better than himself. Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. So shall their blood come back on the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. But for David and all his descendants and for his house and for his throne, there will be peace from Yahweh forevermore. Then Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, went up and struck him down, put him to death. He was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king put Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army in place of Joab. And the king put Zadok, the priest, in the place of Abiathar. Zadok is the, uh, another man from not Eli's line, but a different line of priesthood who comes to power. He was one of the secret spies that David used when he was exiled by Absalom. Verse 36, the king sent and summoned Shimei, remember him, the cursing one, and said to him, build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there. Don't go out from there to any place whatsoever. So there's some pretty clear instructions, right? Remember what David told him to do? David said, kill him. But he says, go build yourself a nice house and never leave it. <laughs> so he's showing him mercy. Uh, verse 37, on the day you go out and you cross the brook Kidron that runs uh, through that area, know for certain you shall die. Your blood will be on your own head. So Shimei said to the king, what you say is good. As my lord the king has said, so will your servant do. And Shimei went and lived in Jerusalem many days. But it happened at the end of three years, the two of Shimei's servants ran away to Akish, the son of Makah, the king of Gath. And when it was told Shimei, behold, your servants are in Gath, Shimei arose and saddled a donkey and went to Gath to Akish to seek his servants. Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath. When Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and returned, the king sent, sent and summoned Shimei and said to him, didn't I make you swear by Yahweh and solemnly warn you, saying, no for certain on the day that you will go out to any place whatsoever and you'll die? And you said to me, what you say is good, I will obey. Well, why then have you not kept your oath? The Yahweh that gave you and the commandment which I commanded you. The king also said to Shimei, you know in your own heart all the harm you did to David, my father. Remember, he overthrew him. He exiled him from Jerusalem. So Yahweh will bring you back your harm on your own head. King Solomon will be blessed. You can tell he's a king now. He's speaking of himself in the third person. King Solomon will be blessed and the throne of David will be established before Yahweh forever. The king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down and he died. The last name on the revenge list crossed off. <laughs> so the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Solomon here is establishing himself as king, doing what David commanded him. He's strong. He's showing himself a man. Now, this doesn't relate one to one to us, right? First of all, there's some ethical differences in the New Testament. You don't say, I'm going to go be a man. I'm going to go kill everyone I have a beef with. <laughs> no. We show ourselves men by being strong and acting courageously, by, by loving our enemies. Real men love their enemies and by serving those in need. That's the New Testament ethic. It's a, a weak sauce approach to shirk from that responsibility and, and not live up to the charges that God has given us. We're not in Solomon's shoes, but we have Solomon's wisdom. We don't sit in Solomon's throne, but we know the one who sits in the throne of heaven and he has told us how we should live. I pray that none of you would shrink from your responsibilities even this week. Lord, we're thankful 
for the boldness with which Solomon acted. What a contrast the way this kingdom on earth was established versus the way your kingdom, you reign over it. You don't enter it through bloodshed or through violence. You enter it through humble, submissive obedience. Nevertheless, Lord, the command is the same. David's command to Solomon is your command to us. Be strong, be courageous, be obedient, be faithful. I pray for the men who are here at part of this church. We know that you've been pleased in your providence to uh, raise up men to lead your church as your word commands. And we're thankful at Emmanuel Bible Church that you have blessed us with so many faithful and godly men. We pray for the men of this church, that they would be strong, that they would never lack the courage to do what you require of them. They would never be timid. They would never have timidity in the face of obedience, that they would never shrink back from their responsibilities. You haven't given us a, sp a spirit of fear timidity, but you've given us a spirit of strength, of power, and boldness, such as fitting men. I'm thankful for the men of this church. I pray for those that are here tonight that are, are not living like the men you want them to be. I pray that you would help them repent of their apathy, that they would, that they would be courageous in their life, that you would give them a track record of faithfulness. And they would do what your word commands them to do, that they would would work hard, that they would study hard, that they would be known for being faithful and mature. Lord, we pray that our church would be marked by maturity, not by immaturity. We pray that our church would be strong, stable, and growing. We're thankful for the model of Solomon, how he pursued obedience to your word with wisdom. Help that be our pursuit as well. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.